reading this morning is from Luke chapter 7, verses 36, and finishes at chapter 8, verse 3, and is on page 1036 in the Church Bibles. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learnt that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he cancelled the debts of both. Now which of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet up my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some of the women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chuzas, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Reverend. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you know I like power. The Bible says that let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you have breath this morning, I think we need to praise the Lord. Father, you are deserving of all praise, all adoration, all exaltation, all worship, all honor, all power, all adoration. You are king, you are lord, you are master, you are savior, you are creator, you are sustainer of all things. We give you honor and praise this morning as we magnify you this morning, King of glory. Thank you for the opportunity to be alive, Lord. Thank you that we are the people of God, that we love the Lord and we've been called by his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Something has been in my heart for a little while, as I've usually heard, and I have made the same error lots of times when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We are told that the Holy Spirit is the only Godhead representative here on earth. And we always use the word, we invite you, Holy Spirit. Well, they invited the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts because he had not come. 
we should not be inviting the Holy Spirit. Why is that? He's already here. We shouldn't be welcoming him. We shouldn't be inviting him because he is in here, because the kingdom of God is within us. So I believe a better way for us to do that is to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you in this place. Let your power be felt in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to be talking or speaking from the book, from the book of Luke chapter 7. This is a very important chapter. Before I get to the uh, particular texts or verses that I will be covering, I just want to bring to our remembrance some previous things that have already occurred before we get to the areas that I will be covering this morning. This is the chapter that spoke to us about the faith of the centurion, if you remember. A man who had great faith that Christ was so impressed with him. Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come into my abode. Just say the word and my servant will be here. And the Lord commended him for such great faith. But one of the areas that has personally affected me, and I've thought about it several times, probably in my own periods of doubt and despondency, is when we talk about or remember what happened to John the Baptist. Now, if you remember clearly, this was the forerunner of Christ. We are told this was the gentleman that was sent ahead of Christ to prepare the way for Christ. This was a man who knew Jesus Christ, all right? But because of his own incarceration, when he was locked up by Herod, when he had moments of deep despondency and clearly deep introspective analysis about his own life and about his own calling. You see, in the private moments of our lives, all kinds of thoughts flow through our minds. And we have to be able to discipline those thoughts or the thick legs and the run away. He began to doubt and he sent a couple of his disciples to go to Jesus and to inquire, are you the real deal? Now imagine that. This was somebody who was born a few, whatever, uh, uh, before Jesus. Their moms knew themselves. He, he, was, he knew he was created to be the one to make the crooked part straight or go ahead of Jesus. But yet again, he was doubting what he's always known. Are you the Christ or is there another to come? That's what happens to us when we find ourselves in difficulty, hopelessness. We start doubting God. And Jesus was so touched, clearly. But I love the way Christ dealt with that question. He said, go and tell him, i.e., the things that Jesus Christ came to do on earth, as Reverend said this morning, to give sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, those who are wounded, who are bruised, is go tell him diseases have been healed, the dead have been raised. Go tell him what you are seeing happening with your eyes, i.e., I am the authentic one. I'm doing the things I came here to do. And then he said, oh, anyone born of a woman, not is greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet. But he said the least of us in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Because at that point, of course, the kingdom had not come. So a little bit of background and a lot of issues with the Pharisees. But then, of course, I come to my main uh, area of discourse this morning. And I want to read from the Amplified, just to put this a little bit in context. Starting from chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to dine with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. 
And behold, a woman of the town who was an especially wicked sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair on her head and kissed his feet affectionately and anointed them with the ointment perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man a prophet, he would surely know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a notorious sinner. You know the Pharisees love sin. A social outcast devoted to sin. And Jesus replying said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, teacher, say it. A certain lender of money at interest had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they had no means of paying, he freely forgave them both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simple question to answer, right? Simon answered, the one I take it, some texts put it, I presume, not wanting to permit of, for whom he forgave and canceled more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly answered, or you have decided correctly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wet them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, for she from the moment that I came into your house has not ceased intermittently to kiss my feet tenderly and caressingly. You did not anoint my head with cheap, ordinary oil, but she has anointed my feet with costly, rare perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many as they are, are forgiving her, because she has loved much. But he who is forgiving little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go enter into peace in freedom from all the distresses that I experienced as the result of sin. Hallelujah. Just in terms of the contextual setting of, this, of these verses, let me begin. I, I suspect we probably need to, to understand the true message. And I had to do a little bit of research to understand the setting, the context, so we can make sense of what is happening here. So here's the background or setting to this amazing story. It is not clear where this incident happened or in what city, as we are not giving the name. The key players were our Lord Jesus Christ, Simon the Pharisee, and of course the uh, woman with a terrible reputation. St. Luke, probably out of gracious kindness, did not mention this woman's name. And I think that was probably done on purpose. Let me, however, state clearly that this incident, though slightly similar, is not the same as recorded in the other three Gospels. You remember similar incidences of a woman anointing the Lord, our Lord Jesus with oil, so on and so forth. This is not the same. And those usually you will find in Matthew 26, 6, 1 to 3, the same uh, story was also told in Mark 14, 3 to 9, and equally in John chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. These other incidences refer to the last week of our Lord of, uh, Jesus Christ's life here on earth. 
while Luke's version is a much earlier event. There is no reason for holding that the woman in the other Gospels was a sinner. The Bible never told us the other story that the woman was a sinner. Okay? John says she was Mary of Bethany. Some have held that Luke's sinner was Mary Magdalene. But this is purely speculation because the Bible does not say that. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And in this particular story, Luke writes in chapter 19, verse 10, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And he is here seeking a lost man. Our Lord Jesus uses the transformed life of this particular woman in question as the testimony to this man, the Pharisee, and to all the people sitting around the table. The, our Lord never missed an opportunity to evangelize. When many people read this account, they tend to identify it as the story of the immoral woman. This really isn't the central piece. She is purely a part of the story. The main story, however, is of Jesus evangelizing a Pharisee. That's what I want us to remember. Okay, let's hold that thought. Anyhow, here's the story. Simon, a Pharisee, invited Jesus to a large public dinner. In the style of the day, the Lord reclined at the low table, really relaxed, because he really re reclined, kind of part line, to enjoy the sumptuous meal that was prepared for him. Probably uh, leaning himself on the left elbow, eating with his hand. His body was stretched out, his feet exposed. Then women who had lived a sinful life, in that town showed up at Simon's house. Make no mistake, she was an especially wicked sinner. Well, the Pharisees just love that word, sinner. She was an immoral woman, as the New Living Translation tells us. Her sins weren't listed in detail because they didn't need to be. She was involved in the world's oldest profession, which requires no job description. We all know what that is. She came alone bearing a small alabaster vial of perfume. Did she intend to give the Lord this flask of ointment, this jar of fragrant oil, or did she mean simply to anoint his head? A common gesture of respect. Whatever her plans, they flew out of the window the moment she met our Lord. Jesus came to seek and to save the Lord. They accused him of being only interested in drunkards and tax collectors and being the friend of sinners. And he was. But he wasn't just a friend of the outcast sinners, the riffraffs, the low lives. He was even the friend of religious sinners, like the Pharisee. In fact, on a number of occasions in the book of Luke, he ate with Pharisees. Right here in this chapter, then again in chapter 11, verse 37, and then again in chapter 14, verse 1. We see him sitting down for a prolonged conversation, obviously intended to expose the Pharisee to the reality of who he really was and why he came. The other Gospels record some of those events as well. Jesus was committed to evangelizing and presenting a Gospel offer to all sinners. Whether they were the low-life sinners or the high-life sinners. Whether they were the outcasts, irreligious, or the very religious. And on this occasion, in an act of irony, he reaches out to demonstrate his power to forgive sins to a hypocritical, self-righteous Pharisee by using the very person that the Pharisee despised the most, the low life, the reprobate, the wretched, the immoral prostitute, whose transformation was very clear and inarguable. This he uses as evidence of his power to transform even the Pharisee. Now remember that the word Pharisee means 
shepherd. Sinners. Sinners. Everybody feel sinners. They were very holy people. They assumed that holiness was primarily a matter of separation. Now, how many of us in the church fall into that same trap? We are supposed to be sinners. Remember that the word, well, I've mentioned that they assumed that holiness was primarily a matter of separation. Holiness was achieved by keeping oneself separate from sin and from sinners. According to this view, Jesus would have to shun this sinful woman in order to remain holy. Simon concluded that either one, Jesus didn't know this woman's character, and he's professing to be a prophet, so he cannot really be a prophet. Or two, that whether or not he knew about her sinfulness, he was physically contaminated by her, and thus he could not be holy. Our Lord knew exactly what Simon was thinking as well. Why his thinking was wrong, Jesus' words to Simon in verses 40 to 47 exposed the error of the pharisaical thinking and explain why the Holy One of Israel would draw near to sinners, even to the point of touching them and being touched by them. For this Pharisee was requesting to dine with him. On the surface, that might seem like a good thing, like he had some personal interest in Jesus, like he was open to Jesus. Well, that's really not the case. As the story makes it very clear, this was a man who belonged to a very close-knit group. There weren't that many of them, a few thousand Pharisees, that's probably all. They were the fastidious guardians of the law. They were the law keepers. They were the people who set the standard to which everybody had to adhere and be measured. They were the legalists. They were the self-righteous. They were tightly knit and they knew internally what they were all about. They had close and intense communication among themselves. So he invites Jesus for a meal. Why? He was looking to trap Jesus. That's the bottom line. To prove what they've always tried to prove. To accuse him that he was not the real thing. So that they could kill him. There are some meals that are maybe more on the go or more on the fly, like your McDonald's go by the window, they hand it over to you and off you go. And then there are some other meals that they really laid out. You relax, you're rushing nowhere. Probably a few hours of intense discuss while you drink your grape juice or whatever it is that you're drinking and enjoy your meal and you have proper banter. This was one of those meals. So he requested him to dine with him and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined. The original says he reclined. So he really relaxed. All right? They took a posture of reclining. In ancient times, what they would do would be have a dinner like this, invite a celebrity speaker or somebody who was known, somebody who was perhaps unusual, who had something to say that was unique, that would be of great interest to them. They would invite them. And then they would throw the doors open and... Though the population of the town were not invited to the meal, they were allowed to come in if they wanted to and stand around the perimeter of the room, observe it. They would stand around the walls, perhaps in a somewhat darkened place, just unobtrusively, enjoying the conversation and the dialogue as a form of local entertainment, amusement, and information. And that is no doubt what happened on this occasion. The table is in the middle. Everybody who is around the table is leaning on the table. And around the perimeter walls, there's a space for the local people to come in and experience the event itself and to hear the discussion and learn from it. Also, typically in that kind of environment, poor people would come in the hopes that they would be able to pick some of the scraps or the crumbs off the table and therefore be able to eat and to feed their own families as well. So we're getting the second right, what was probably happening with this scenario. Some of the day laborers who perhaps hadn't had work some of those who were indigent and couldn't work and needed help would then benefit by either begging around the perimeter when the time was appropriate after the meal was over, or even being offered some of the scraps from the meal to take for themselves. 
So it was not unusual to have people around. It was not unusual to have people of a lower class or a lower station in life that would normally be invited to a Pharisee's house. That's the scenario. Verse 37, however, says, And behold, when we hear the word behold, it indicates something startling or something shocking is taking place here. It wasn't shocking for a stranger to come in, and it wasn't even shocking for a poor person to come in, a local neighbor to come in, but behold, it was shocking that there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, there was certainly opportunity for some people to come in there, but not a woman who was a sinner. That is to say, in most likelihood, a prostitute. There was a woman in the city. She lived there. Everybody knew her. She plied her trade in that town. This is the kind of woman that we are here introduced to, and she learned in verse 37 that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She learned. She heard it. She knows the general protocol that the doors will be open and access will be available. It's not like you would think of today, any time they have a very special dinner with very important people, they lock the door. But we lock the doors or we put the bars on the doors, bar the gate and put security guards out there. That's not the scenario here. Different world, different time. In this time, the ancient times, she knows that Jesus is going to be there, and she has a plan. So she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Now, perfume was part of the trade of being a prostitute, obviously. And it was also a part of just being a woman. Many Jewish women in those days had around their neck a vial of perfume on a cord or a leather tongue, which they kept with them all the time. It was a sort of deodorizing agent in a very different kind of walk than we are used to today. It was not uncommon for women to spend a lot of money on perfume in ancient times. The kind of perfume that's indicated here, however, is not cheap or cheap oil, but a costly perfume. It's in an alabaster container. An alabaster container specifically was quarried and carved in Egypt. And apparently this woman comes to the event with a view to anointing Jesus' hair with this costly perfume, indicating to us that she was somewhat successful as a prostitute because the perfume is not cheap. You must really get a lot of money for free. Most of them make a lot of money, and apparently she had made enough to be able to purchase a costly alabaster flask of perfume, which she wanted to pour out on the head of Jesus. That was her objective and her People are welcome, but not her. She shouldn't be here. This is a violent outrage of the purity of the home of a Pharisee for a prostitute to come in there. And so she slips in anyway, and perhaps looking around the room, identifies where Jesus is. And it says in verse 38, she was taking her place, standing behind him at, at, at his feet. So when she came in, she went to the feet of Jesus, probably in her mind, wondering how and when she would have the opportunity to anoint his hair with this costly perfume, which she so much wanted to do. Shocking that she's even there. She stayed out of the way. She stayed back in the background near the feet of Jesus, standing there, no doubt, pondering what to do. How was she going to get to the place where she could anoint his hair, which was her target? This was what was in her heart. This is what she wanted to do with a sacrificial, profuse expression of love and generosity towards him. As she stands there, amazingly, she begins to weep. Now, whenever we hear stories of people encountering Jesus, they usually fall at his feet, some start, start weeping, just standing before falling. There's just something about our Lord that breaks down everybody. She begins weeping. She is just flooded with the reality of the kind of woman that she is. And she's just weeping over her, overwhelmed with emotion. She lets loose with what Luther called heart, heart water. And it burst out. She just turned on the pipes. She really turned on the taps. And she just allowed it to flow. And as she weeps, because of where she is, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She's weeping, and naturally she looks down and she sees, of all things, that the host has never provided a servant to wash the feet of Jesus, which was the custom. 
because they wore sandals and they walked great distances, and their feet were usually very dirty. She noticed that his feet are dirty, and this is really a social disgrace. And so since the tears are profusely running down her face and she has no water other than her tears, she allows them to fall on the feet of Jesus. And this outburst of emotion is gaining a lot of momentum. Then it says she began to wet, i.e. the Greek word breko, which means it began to rain down with tears. Literally, she rained tears on his feet. She had no water, but her heart water. But it was enough to wash his feet. Her emotion so strong. There she is before she thinks any further about how she can anoint his head. Caught up in the fact that nobody has given the simplest dignity to our Lord by washing his feet. And so her tears are a sufficient supply of liquid to give. And so, swept away in the emotion, she snaps the alabaster bottle and she pours perfume out on his head. I mean, this could be a very difficult situation for Jesus. Just imagine it. This is our Lord we're talking about here in the first place. And this was a prostitute. She's simply taking down her hair, the most glorious part of her body. Read the book of Corinthians. It's the, it's the hair of the woman. Certainly in the view of the Pharisee, she's touching him. Not only is she touching him, but she's washing his feet with her hair. Not only that, but she continues to embrace his feet, to hold on to him, as if she didn't want to let him go. Expressing this emotion, and then she's pouring out this perfume. This could be a very serious bit of propriety. What will people be saying? So Simon was disgusted by the scene he was witnessing. But it was a satisfied disgust. Because it vindicated in his mind that Jesus clearly cannot be a prophet if he's allowing all the things to be happening. And the kind of woman that was doing all this to him. So clearly, I'm right, he cannot be a prophet. Now, what is the conclusion? The Lord told uh, um, Simon. and blew Simon away with just those very simple words. I came into your house. The basics you did not even provide for me. I you didn't give me a food. You didn't even ask one of the servants to wash my feet. This woman has done much more than you could ever dream of doing to me. And she gave the scenario of the two letters. One for 500 pounds. Which of those two people do you think? I've been forgiving of some people in the past in my life. And I knew I danced around, I celebrated, I screamed, I, 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 you know, I went absolutely ballistic, full of joy. Because I've been let off this hook, this catch. And so would you. If somebody came and forgave you 500 pounds that you owed or 5,000 pounds that you owed right now, how would you feel? Compare that to somebody who owed 50 pounds, which was greater. So the Lord made an example, and Simon thought, well, this is a trick question for such a simple answer, but let me answer it nonetheless. And he, of course, the one that owed the most, the most money. The Lord said, yes, you've answered correctly. Okay? So what do we draw from this? Those who are forgiving most love the most. The first lesson of this incident is that Christ came to seek and to save sinners. This is because in his first advent, when he came, he came to bear the penalty for man's sin himself and to save men from eternal damnation. All who come to him for forgiveness and salvation will be saved. None will be turned away. But there is yet another coming of Christ. When he comes to judge at that time, it will be too late. Those who come to him then will tremble in fear of him and rightly so. What I love best about this lady watching was the fact that not a single word was uttered by her. She just spent her time in simplicity, in her own mind, at home, passing the time, not wanting to let him go. Quietly just there, sobbing, crying, 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 kissing, kissing, kissing his feet, cleaning or an anointing him, just giving him all she had. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we are told that the Holy Spirit is within us. 
and that the kingdom of God is within. Anybody who is born again has received the kingdom. All right? The kingdom is the government of God. The kingdom is the reality of God, the realm, the rule of God. The kingdom of God is where God lives and how God and where God rules. He has given you and I that power. So that you and I today, we are carrying kingdom. Outside of this church building, anybody we encounter should be encountering the kingdom of God. In our places of work and business, schooling, anybody who encounters you is encountering the kingdom of God. We are the eyes, the feet, the legs, the mouth of God. The question is, can anybody see God in you? Thank you.